Hey guys, I'm sorry that we had to miss class on Thursday last week. So I just wanted to come and do a little video for you. Um, not sure if Meredith will show this tonight in class or if she'll just add it to your resources, but um, I know you read the envelope chapter this week and I wanted to talk a little bit more about different wall structures and envelopes as you are planning to do your research this week. Um, I know you already did site analysis, so hopefully a little bit more information on the site analysis was good and valuable to you um, as you're planning your projects. I uh, can't stress enough how important site analysis is, and um, as architects we don't always get a chance to go out and spend a lot of time on the site, so um, I made that part of my practice where I spend a lot of time out on the site and I partnered with a landscape architect who is just absolutely brilliant about site and landscaping and working with the natural landscape and helping you move through your site and around your site to get the best water runoff, best drainage, um, but also the standard convention here in Maine um, thus far of what I've come across is a lot of placing a house or structure and then bringing in fill to fill up around the structure, which uh, I guess works okay, but it makes it feel like we have these big things that just sort of pop out of the landscape and that they don't really participate in part of the land. And one of the things that I consider part of sustainability is durability and quality of life in a space and wanting to stay there. You go to Europe and you see all these really old stone buildings that have been there for a long time and the streets are addressed to people scale and how they walk and the windows and the levels that they're at. And there's just something magical about how they've upkept these buildings for hundreds of years because they just care and they take a little bit of extra time with that. And so creating sites where it's easy to get in and out. It's easy to get into the driveway. The house isn't just sticking up out of the, the ground where you're oriented to solar orientation to take advantage of passive solar or wind cooling. Um, you may read a little bit about that in the site work. Um, daylight planning, maybe you're an early riser, so you plan to have the master bedroom on the east side of the house so it rises with the sun. I think you'll get more into daylight planning in the next chapter under lighting. Um, but that's something that's really important during site analysis is how do you orient the building and orientation for the most part is free as long as you're not working against the land to make your building site fit. Orientation doesn't cost more so that's one of those really great sustainable features that is a simple spend a little bit of time on the site and really make sure that you get the house in the right location. Um, we go out, we stake the site with the surveyor, with the um, compass, and we make sure that we've got the right orientation and then we'll stand in the space and be like, oh no, maybe we wanna move the house over five feet this way so that we're not looking at the neighbor or looking at some ugly tree or if we tilt the orientation just slightly, you have the optimal view or the best place for clearing for solar on your roof. So. Um, maybe you're looking or walking out to a stream or creating a walkout basement by moving uh, the structure over just a little bit. So site analysis is really important, especially as you're thinking about the envelope and proceeding forward. So um, you read some about that, you've done some site analysis for your projects, and now you're moving on to construction and wall systems, which is very exciting. Um, so I want to share my screen, if I can, here, and talk to you about a couple of building enclosures and some great sites. Okay, so on the screen now, you should be able to see buildingscience.com. And I'm seeing what you're seeing. So buildingscience.com, it should be up on the screen. And I'm going to put my camera down so in case I disappear, I'm not sure if I'm off on the side of your screen or not. I am. Look at that. Anyway, buildingscience.com is up on the screen. This is a really great website. Um, and the way that you get to the screen that I'm on is you go up here to guidance, you go to enclosures that work, and you'll be able to see a lot of building enclosures. This is definitely a site that I highly recommend that you guys visit during your um, planning for what building enclosure system that you want to use. It's a really fabulous site. 
that gives you a detailed explanation of how it goes together. This is, you know, a single top plate, two by six wall studs at 24 inches on center, taped and painted gypsum wall board, which might be your air barrier, cellulose insulation in the wall cavity, OSB sheathing and a water control layer. Um, and I really want you guys to dig into water control layers. This is something I've been talking about a lot on the podcast recently because Maine is in zone six and we have a lot of heating degree days, which means we have a lot of time where we are heating the inside of our buildings and the temperature on the outside of our buildings is really high. We actually have a high vapor drive from the inside of the building to the outside and we want that to dry out. So OSB sheathing, depending on what type of OSB sheathing you use, is often glued together. Um, that glue may not actually be permeable, so you could be stopping moisture migration to the exterior of your building in your sheathing layer and you might cause it to condense there and rot out your sheathing layer. Layer. So you want to know what the permeance of each layer is. Here in Maine, you've often heard that you want to put a vapor barrier on the inside of your building structure. That'll help to reduce the amount of vapor that's pushed into your wall system. Um, it's not critically important that you put the vapor barrier on the inside. It's critically important where you put the vapor barrier. So you definitely don't want it to be on the outside. We are moving to a lot more vapor open structures. So our double stud wall system is a vapor open structure so that the vapor moves and dries to the inside through the sheetrock and dries to the outside through our plywood layer or whatever we have on the outside. So definitely take a look as you're putting together your wall systems on what's the permeance of the OSB or the zip system plus OSB. The OSB in the zip system is actually less permeable than the the green uh, water resistive barrier um, on the outside of it. This one is showing mineral fiber insulation on the exterior plus wood furring strips and wood siding. Um, we are huge proponents of rain screens. In this scenario, the minimal fiber board can't hold up the weight of your siding, so you definitely need to have um, some kind of strapping, but it's really good for your siding to have strapping because that allows your siding to dry on the inside and the outside, and it also allows any moisture vapor that's coming through your wall system to hit that open channel and drop down without pushing through your wood siding. So if you see a lot of old buildings where the paint is peeling off. Um, that's because the moisture vapor and the heat from the inside of the house is pushing out through the wall system and it's actually pushing the paint off the siding. So this allows your siding to dry a little bit better. So we're huge proponents of uh, strapping on a wall system. For sure. So anyway, this is two by six advanced frame construction. So we talked a little bit about this two weeks ago um, on Thursday when we looked at the overall performance of the wall system where 24 inches on center is maybe 15% framing factor where uh, 16 inches on center is more of a 25% framing factor. So advanced framing is trying to cut out some of that. But at the same time, we've also had a lot of discussion with our builders recently saying that the wood products aren't the same as they had been in the past. A lot of them are twisted and not straight. So sometimes 24 inches on center makes things too wavy and makes other parts of construction difficult. So just something to think about as you're putting together your, um, your structure and and what you think might go into it. I'm showing you this one because I'm hoping here at the end I'm going to show you a little picture of the Go Home, um, which is also another great resource by Geologic, um, something that they created in their typical wall system and you know getting to passive house layers. So Another wall assembly that we have is ICF. I included this in here. Um, there aren't too many all ICF houses because they're a little bit challenging to do. Um, you have to cut channels on the inside to run your wiring. Concrete doesn't actually have any R value at all, so you're reliant strictly on the foam that you have. Um, and you're probably going to hear me start talking more about 
foam projects uh, in the future because I'm actually sort of against spray foam and foam products. As we move forward, we want to try to get away from really high carbon dense materials. And the way they make foam and how it's produced and manufactured and gets to the site is actually really difficult on climate change. So as we're in the sustainability class and we're thinking about, you know, 30 years and, you know, improving the efficiency of the structure and the operational costs of living in it, you know, we talk about net zero homes. So so the house produces everything that it needs to operate. But a net zero home in the middle of 18 acre woods that's all filled with spray foam is actually going to have a bigger impact on our environment than you know something that might be code built. So thinking about the materials in the previous one with the um, cellulose insulation, cellulose is a renewable material, also the geologic uh, People are putting together a factory right now where they're going to be making uh, wood fiber exterior insulation, wood fiber bats, and wood fiber blown in insulation because Maine has a lot of wood. It's a renewable product that we have here. Um, as cellulose gets harder and harder to come by because it comes with plastics and other things in it, there are less newspapers being read. Um, wood fiber insulation is actually a great substitute. So they're taking an old paper factory and they're putting that into uh, you know, milling building materials that we need that are carbon negative because wood absorbs carbon dioxide as it's growing. And then we use this product and try to to offset some of the higher carbon materials that we have. So anyway, this is an ICF. We use these in basements. Um, you do need, um, which it's not showing here because this isn't a below ground surface, but you know we do our material for our water infiltration uh, below ground. Again, with the furring strips and the cladding because you can't attach it directly to the spray foam, but uh, you could potentially do an all ICF house. Um, and again, with the foams that are terrible, concrete actually produces 9% of the world's carbon um, so when we talk about this, getting away from concrete as a material as much as possible is something that I might recommend, might tell you to think about, um, to do a little bit of research on, you know, how bad concrete is for the environment and why as you're putting together your wall systems. Double stud, this is something that I do all the time. Um, we've done a lot of double stud wall framing where we have two stud walls it's very easy for a contractor to understand because you're essentially just building a second stud wall you can put everything electrical plumbing in your interior stud wall you have a continuous insulation layer in between the two stud sections so if you read about thermal bridging um, at the very beginning of the chapter this is how we separate those wood studs we talked a little bit about it as we went through the whole um, area weighted u values of the whole wall system so double stud walls, um, in this case, you wouldn't have to do strapping if you've got a vinyl siding. Um, but again, I go back to let's use wood materials, let's treat them correctly so they dry on both sides, let's do strapping, let's do cladding, let's do cellulose, which is a, a um, carbon, a very low carbon material. Let's use wood studs, which are carbon negative throughout the whole uh, system. And let's move on here. I'm going to scroll down here too, because it talks about your thermal control layer. It talks about durability and rain screen, air leakage control, vapor control, drying, built-in moisture, um, buildability and cost of materials. So this is a great resource for you to read through where you can find out more information about double stud walls and all of the things that are part of that. We've got a SIPS wall panel system. Again, this goes back to using spray foam. Is it good? Is it bad? Have we used more carbon by building a SIPS panel than we would have by building a code built house and living in it for the next 30 years? Um, things to think about. But essentially, SIPS panels are structurally insulated panels. They have a foam section in the middle. They typically have eye joists, which really cut down on the thermal bridging to a very minimal amount of OSB, which does not translate a lot of heat from the inside to the outside. Um, they go up quickly, so you can have a whole house structure in a couple of days. Um, again, down here, vapor control, permeability, because it's foam, it doesn't actually have a lot of vapor transfusion through the wall structure itself. So it can be a good option in really wet climates for areas where it's very humid. 
Dress wall construction is something that you might have seen recently. Um, they're building their own trusses or doing this with the exterior eye joists, which stick off of the outside of the building. Um, when we talk deep energy retrofits um, and people wanting to add insulation to the exterior, a lot of times they're just going to do a skin of either rigid insulation, mineral wool, or uh, wood fiber but it's often uh, possible to do this exterior truss system and dense packs the exterior truss system if you're trying to get to a passive house level and you have to take the roof off and you have room to do an extension um, this is going to significantly improve the insulation value of your wall system an advanced framing with a layer of XPS. So again, here is your traditional wall system. Here's your layer of exterior insulation. This is actually something that's coming up in the MUBEC and the code as we move forward is doing a continuous layer of insulation. It doesn't have to be on the exterior. It reduces thermal bridging if, if it's in the middle with the um, double stud wall. It reduces it as on the exterior, whether it's a uh, rigid plastic foam, XPS, or whether it is a um, mineral wool, um, which was one of the first ones that we showed you, a wood fiber insulation, um, any continuous thermal break to cut down on the transmission of heat through a poorer performing wall section is going to be a really great option. And here you can also see that it's covering the band joist, which the band joist tends to be one of the leakiest places in the house. So it's something that you want to think about and address. So anyway, that's a series of different wall systems that are available. Um, there are many more, so go up here, go to guidance, go to enclosures network, and you can scroll through all of these different wall systems that are on here. It tells you whether it's cold climate, whether it's a uh, foundation, whether it is an exterior wall system. So uh, feel free to go through all of this, pick a climate zone, you know, we're in cold, so you can search all the cold wall systems and enclosures that work. So great resource, buildingscience.com. Then this is the go home. Um, and I wanted to bring this up. I'm sure it's come up across uh, many of your uh, research. Geologic has been doing a lot of really great things for the state of Maine. They build panelized construction, which is another reason I went to bring this up because panelized construction doesn't have to just be SIPs panels. It can be any number of panels. So Unity is panelizing, uh, Geologic is panelizing, EcoCore is panelizing. They're all up here in, um, two of them are in the state of Maine. Unity is in New Hampshire, but they're within a couple of hours. They're local, they're using local materials, and they're building to really high standards for Passive House. So you can go through here and you can check out their patented super insulated foundation. This is based off of uh, Passive House originally, which is eight inches under the slab, six inches along the slab edge. You can see this great detail that they did here while they were thermally modeling interior versus exterior warm to cold and how much of a difference it makes to really add that thermal break between your foundation and your exterior ground. Um, this is a place that often gets missed in uh, in building in Maine. Uh, people have a tendency to forget about what is in their foundation or in their basement. Then they also have passive house building shell. So they're building with a two by eight structural stud wall, seven and a quarter inches of dense pack cellulose insulation, six inches of rigid mineral wool. These guys are totally foam free. They don't want to use any foam in their buildings. Um, as far as the system goes, obviously there is some XPS in, or I mean, sorry, EPS, which is a better foam product. There's EPS in their foundation, but in their wall systems above grade, uh, totally foam free. And then R50 thermal performance in their wall system. Then their roof prefabricated trusses, taped zip air system, 24 inches of blown in cellulose, R80 thermal performance. You can see some of the pictures of the different go homes that they've built. They have triple glazed windows, um, which jumps us into glazing, which you read about, U-factors, uh, solar heat grain, visual transmittance, uh, what's operable, how airtight are they, um, 
these tilt and turn European windows are phenomenal. They have a huge thickness. The gear gap between the window panes is uh, really thick, and so they perform very well. You can sit next to it, be really comfortable, because you're going to give heat to the window, and that's why we often feel drafty and cold in front of a window. But also, um, the way these are constructed with the gaskets, they're other than a fixed window, this is as tight of a window as you can get with moving parts because it closes, it locks down, and it pulls that gasket tight. Double hungs and sliders are the worst as far as air performance goes. Um, so a double hung and a slider, just the nature of the way they're built, they're really loose, they're really leaky, they let a lot of air movement in. So fixed, tilt and turns, then we have casements, then we have double hungs and sliders kind of rounding out the bottom of, of the class as far as that goes. But triple glazed windows with low E coatings, which helps to, for the thermal performance. Then you have uh, R11 at the center of the glass. You have a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.5, so you're actually allowing more solar light into the space in the wintertime so that you can have passive solar heating. That you need to then add a um, shading device on the exterior, depending on how many you have in the south and west facades so that you don't have overheating in the summer, which seems like a silly concept here in Maine, but in actuality, they are uh, big concerns when you have a super insulated house because if it gets hot inside, it'll stay hot inside. Then air tightness tested. So they're going for passive house levels, which is a 0.6 ACH. Current code is 5 ACH, down from 7 from the 2009 IECC. Um, we usually aim for between 1 and 2 in our pretty good house, and passive house levels are down to 0.6 air changes per hour. Honestly, guys, air sealing is the easiest way to make a vast improvement on a structure, and it really just takes some time and patience. It doesn't have to be more cost effective, but uh, in building, time is money. So the first house you do is going to take a lot longer. By the third house, hopefully your crew uh, figured out how to do things more effectively. And then continuous fresh air ventilation. It's really important to provide ventilation. Houses do not need to breathe. Occupants need to breathe. We need to exchange the air on the inside. We need to get rid of any toxins, any VOCs, any excessive moisture so that we don't cause mold problems. And uh, our furniture and everything else that we have has VOCs in it. So even if we're getting down here and we're putting in low VOC paint and we're making sure we have formaldehyde create products, you could still have things that are trapped inside with your furniture, the fabric that you brought in, um, cabinetry that's made in warehouses. So they're doing reliable, efficient systems in this all electric, heated with heat pumps, solar panels on the roof, uh, LED light fixtures, low flow water fixtures. And again, here we're back to wood sidings uh, that are installed over strapping so that they have a much better longevity on their lifespan standing seam metal roof if you can afford to do it. It's three times more expensive, but it lasts three times as long, so it's also great, and it's not made of all the things that asphalt shingles are made of. And then clear and bright interiors, this is something that they pride themselves on. Again, this goes back to the VOCs, the kitchen cabinetries, the things that are coming into their uh, sites. So, let's go back to sharing, and let's share some wall sections. So here now you're looking at the wall sections. Again, we're going to close so you can't see when I'm, whoops, that made everything go to sleep. We don't want to do that either. So here on the screen, this is one of my wall sections for double wall systems. You can see here we have a slab on grade. We have extra insulation along the slab edge. Our structural wall is on the outside on our concrete so we don't have to cover our concrete. And then we have rigid insulation underneath the slab. We have our vapor barrier under the slab under the whole section because we want to make sure that we have um, a separation between our cellulose insulation and our concrete wall because the concrete wall can wick moisture up into this area. We also built it on a single 
plate um, in this case because we wanted to make sure that we had bearing for our interior wall on the foam because of the layout here. We have strapping and siding, so we're going to strap this blue line that you see here is our water resistive barrier, and that's going to connect to our uh, air barrier, which is here on the bottom side of our truss. So this is a uh, wall section that we just got started on. You can see a couple of different configurations going out over our wall system. Um, here we have uh, an upper level that we're working out the details for. Um, but so these are some wall sections for, uh, that we're putting together for a double stud wall system. We also have exterior insulation. So this was actually from a project from Unity that we did exterior wall insulation. And um, we had the opportunity to move our band joists to the inside because our structural wall was actually on the inside here, which was fantastic. So we were able to get a lot of insulation on the outside of our band joist. Um, these wall panels connected together here on the outside, as you can see, this is an insulated stud cavity with sheathing on the inside for our shear, and then we have an interior panel configuration where we ran all of our electrical, all of our plumbing, and we insulated that core. Then we have a layer of exterior wood fiber insulation on the outside, and then strapping and siding. So um, we can go through and take a look more at these. Uh, See if we can zoom in. So you can see we had standing seam metal roof, we had our sheathing, we had our ice and water shield, um, we had trusses, we have it coming all the way out over our exterior wall insulation here. You can see we have inset triple pane windows, uh, exterior siding, the strapping, the exterior continuous rigid insulation. Um, Two by six framing, 24 inches on center, dense packed cellulose. We have our wall sheathing on the inside. And as you can see, this is a fully vapor open structure. So we allow it to dry to the inside and to the outside. And then down here, we have a basement slab and anchor details again, separations from our slabs. We want to do that everywhere that we can. Connection details and LVL rim joists for where our insulated sections connect together. So anyway, more details on that. And then our typical, oh, I have this labeled as double stud wall. Oh, there it is. So here's our double stud wall. Again, doing uh, our ventilation up and over, trying to keep wind washing from coming into our cellulose insulation. We have our wall cavities, we have our siding, we have our air gap, we have our WRB, which in this case is the self-adhesive WRB by SEGA. We had our sheathing, we had our two 24 inch on center studs. We have them separated in the middle by our continuous insulation. In this case, we actually have spray foam in the rim joist because it is a very difficult area to get to. So we want to minimize as much foam as we can, um, but we're using that here in the uh, in the band joist. And then we did an ICF foundation wall here. So we have our ICF, we have our concrete block, we have our interior ICF again separating our slab. We have our insulation, we have our radon pipe on the inside, and exterior drainage. Uh, in the gravel layer here. So um, we can talk about these more in class, but I wanted to kind of give you some ideas of different types of wall systems that we may or may not have done on some of our projects. So anyway, I just wanted to create a little video, go through some of that with you. Um, I also want to talk a little bit more about uh, the drawings that you see on the board back here where we want our air barrier, our thermal barrier, and our water control barrier all to be continuous and we want them all to be in contact. So we basically can create a shrink wrap box around all of it. We want to be aware of what causes vapor movement through the structure. So exhaust fans are going to pull vapor through a structure. We have stack effect, which is anything that's going up and it's pulling air up through the top of the system, creates suction on the bottom, exhaust it out the top. And then we have a difference in temperature between the inside and outside, which is gonna push air and moisture and heat out through our surface structure. And we can create 
um, these barriers and these thought processes on thinking about how vapor and how air moves through our structure and our thermal boundary layers. So um, sure you're going to have lots of questions for me in class on Thursday. So hopefully I will see you then. Have a great day.